Mwiru Eneza, please get seated. Let me start by thanking our ambassador, Matilda, and the whole team that worked with her to put all of this together for this Rwanda Day event where the discussion surrounded was around the culture of Rwanda and many other aspects of Rwandan people and society and nation. So thank you very much. And I think there was no better place to hold such an event and a discussion than San Francisco. <clears throat> San Francisco as a city, part of uh, California, is a place many of you know better than me but it brings together all cultures from across the world. It's a place known for technology. It has that history of bringing people together and accept, accepting them and enables people to express themselves freely in many ways. So thank you, San Francisco and the people who live here, who are here with us. We are happy all of us together here for this event. I want to thank my fellow Rwandans, those who live here in the United States, who came from Canada, who came from Europe, and many of those who came from Rwanda itself. There are many of those who came from Rwanda who have come here for the first time, who don't even speak a word of English, but uh, they are ready to understand what I'm saying. <laughs> Even in English. And they have done that before. They've been attending many Rwanda events, Rwanda Day events, wherever we have been. And they do that in actual fact as a sign of good culture. They love their country, they love their leaders, they also want 
to integrate with others from across the world. So thank you very much, those who Now, there was a lot of discussion about culture, about history, about values, and the presenters did it so eloquently that I won't dwell much on that, the meaning and the place these have in any nation across the world, the meaning all these have for people and Rwanda being no exception. I'm trying to find the way to begin my discussion with you on this, but let me just start by, you know, recently I went to Yale University. I was invited to speak there. The audience was big. The discussion was good. There are exchanges of views and so on and so forth. Later on, I read something written by somebody, I think, who works and maybe lives in a tier, a well-educated person, maybe a very good student, or supposedly so, of history. But later on, I saw something written online talking about my presentation at Yale. But what was said in this piece could not be farther from the truth of what I actually said. For that person, he summarized what I said by saying, I talked about the history of Rwanda, the context, and everything. And for him, he chose to say, to summarize it by saying, Rwanda, Rwanda's president, Paul Kagame, told the audience and through his speech was telling the rest of the world that they should mind their own business, that they have nothing to do with the affairs of Rwanda. Apart from that not being Correct. I didn't see anything close to that. But when I kept examining it, I actually said, maybe I should have said it. <laughs> What's actually wrong with telling people to mind their own business. 
I think we should all be minding our own business. <laughs> so, and in fact, it is something that I was reminded of because minding other people's business, their own business, may be in itself a very bad culture. Or if you want to do that, why don't you do it? Why don't you have a conversation with the people for whom it is their business. And then they will welcome you. And you can be part of minding their business. But I could see where this person is coming from. And it is part of the problem we are seeing across the world. People ignoring that, or some people ignoring that, others, based on their culture, on their history, on their context, on their values, they are people who actually want to mind their own business, who want to build, to build their lives, their societies, their nations. But where this person comes from is that place that says we know better for everybody. We know better for Rwandans, what they need, how they should live their lives. So they would necessarily be very prescriptive. You know, they will write a list of things you must do, things you can't do, you shouldn't do, and, and there is no debate about that. They will want not expect you to say what you want to say, or to express yourself as to what life you want to lead. Then, as if that was not enough, just from there, I go back to New York, we had the UN General Assembly, and I meet their friends, leaders, and one of them, when we met and we embraced, we took his head present. How do you manage to look fine, as I see, with all this that goes on uh, daily, that I read in the papers and all kinds of things? With all the kinds of beat that you get from uh, some international institutions, the media, the rights groups, and so on and so forth. I say, how do you manage? He said, you look fine. 
And I told him, I said, you know, there's something you don't know. I not only look fine, I feel fine. about looking anything, I don't know, but I know how I feel. <laughs> and you know why I feel fine? It's because Rwanda as a nation and where we have come from and what we've been doing for ourselves. And actually basing on this culture that Rwandans are there for each other and for this time, I've been selected as their leader. I think Rwandans make it easy because of this culture of being there for each other, of the values that we uphold, of our desire for our dignity, and the many things the panel has said of how I think we are ready to stand up to any of these challenges as history has shown. You know, it reminds me of uh, part of the history that we live with as refugees. And it speaks to the strong culture that has uh, a lot of meaning. And maybe that's how Rwandans survived against all kinds of adversity, survived and rebuilt their lives even after the tragedy of 1994. And we were able to pick our pieces, rebuild, make progress, and we are where we are. In those old days, Rwandans as refugees, uh, I was living, by the way, as a refugee in the place where Mwenda, who made a presentation here, is born, Western Uganda. I was there before he was born, so he doesn't know <laughs> all this. I used to see young people who were older than me go to rural areas to the Ugandans, the citizens of that country where we were as refugees. You know, members of many families going to work, to do manual work, so that they can be, in exchange, they can receive food to take home to feed the other members of the families. One important thing I want to mention to you here is these young people who would go to do the work and receive food to take back home to feed their families, they would be there almost the whole day working. The people they would be working for 
Maybe they would have meals, either breakfast or lunch. When these young people are there, different homes, different places where they are working. And these good people they were working for used to invite them to come and share with them a meal. You know, nearly all of them would not sit down to share a meal. For one simple reason, it's not because uh, they would not be hungry, it's not because they thought there was anything wrong with the people who were offering them to share meals. No. These young people had the sense of saying, I left members of my family back without food. They are not eating until I get back home. I need to be rushing back home and take this food so that we share the food we have worked for and not for me to sit here and be eating when my relatives are starving. Do you get a sense of it? They would just say, thank you. But uh, we are in a hurry, we want to carry this food home, and they would be there looking at people they are working for, have meals, and they would not sit down to it. Not because of anything else, but because they are thinking of their families back home they left, hungry and not having food. So if you will, this kind of culture is a strong culture. It kept people together. It kept them together in a sense of dignity. They wanted to work for whatever they get. Later on, as we saw, fought for it, fought for their country and fought for their dignity. <laughs> and this quest and fight for dignity did not end with the life of refugees. It had to continue, even when we got back to the country. We had to say, well, this is the life we lived. The struggle has got to continue to change the life of this nation, the life of everyone. And you could not, we could not change the life of everyone as a kind of uh, some people giving others a gift, but as, and by the way of bringing everybody to participate, to feel like they are working, they are working hard, to be where they deserve to be and get what they deserve to have. This is a strong culture. This is an important culture. And culture, in many regards, is neutral. It doesn't have much to do with the politics, with the ideology. It transcends that. It's a common thread that runs through many activities you see in a society 
and brings people together. So what I forgot to tell you that was important when I was uh, answering this uh, leader and a good friend of mine saying, you know, I told him, I said, uh, with this kind of uh, suffering people have had or the kind of pressures from outside and the beating and everything, I gave him uh, an example of, uh, do people know there is a plant, this plant called the Saiso, you know Saiso, from which you get uh, is a fiber that forms a very tough uh, strings and tough ropes are made out of that. It's, it's a plant, Saiso, S-I-S-A-L. It's grown a lot in, in some African countries, mainly Tanzania and, and so on. I said, Rwandans, based on uh, our culture and the desire to fight for our dignity, the analogy would be, analogy would be like, uh, you know, SISO, SISO, before you get uh, very tough ropes out of that, it is crushed and heat and beaten and ever, ever beating, you get these very strong, very tough ropes come out of it. So the more and the harder you beat Rwanda, you get this. <laughs> what comes out is uh, these people who really want to give it back to you, who want to push back, who want to say, wait a minute, let's have a discussion. Or is, uh, it's going to be hard uh, to just uh, bow to you uh, because it's not where we belong. We belong to a place, to a nation that can engage in a conversation. that can give and take. We just can't be a nation of taking. No, we must be a nation of giving as well. <laughs> when you're used to taking, you take even what is not suitable to you. So we, we just don't take, we, we, we give, we want to give. And Rwanda is not alone in this. It's a general problem for the whole continent. And for us in Rwanda, we decided to play our part, for example, when you have heard that All Africans, for example, can travel to Rwanda without having to look for and pay and, and look and pay for a visa. Rwandans just uh, Africans just come and arrive at the airport and uh, or uh, uh, apply for a visa online and they will be in Rwanda. We don't make it difficult for Africans to travel to Rwanda. It's born, 
It's born of this culture of saying, we want to be there for each other. We want to work together, we want to cooperate. So with this background then, how are we expected to simply be subservient and say, you know, you see, our values tell us that you must do this. So how about my values? I can understand your values may tell you to. That's the best thing. It's like when I had a mention early on the panel, people talking about westernization. Westernization may be a very good thing. But for whom and how? No, for me, what I would be looking for is modern Africanization. Say, you know, you know, people, you know, this uh, liberal democracy, you know, you, you must swallow it without uh, chewing. And I say, no, 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 but uh, in our culture, we chew these things we are supposed to swallow. <laughs> we just don't swallow anything, we, we chew, we, you know, we. So, who, who said that this is what we must all swallow? And swallow it the way you, you do it. We have our thing. I'm an African, I don't know what you are. <laughs> what you are is your business. <laughs> My business is to be who I am, and as an African. I want to be an African, a modern one, an African that can relate well, meaningfully, to the rest of the world. <laughs> Not an African who is there, lost in the jungle, looking for people who are very magnanimous and, and gracious to give me a sense of direction. No. Well, this is a good thing. You, you, that might be... Actually, some of the mistakes are made unintentionally or behind some of these mistakes that are good intentions, but nonetheless, if we are not careful, we end up with consequences that everybody ends up regretting. We look at the whole world, the state of affairs, and the situation as it is. I'm not very reassured, given what is going on, that if we were to mind my business, my own business, that uh, there are no consequences that uh, I may face by just uh, being uh, so falsely polite as to accept to swallow everything you push down my throat. 
in, the, in, the, in any case, why? Why should I? The best way maybe is to accept me the way I am, is to accept us the way we are, and in the way we, the world is uh, interdependent and uh, inter interconnected, or even with the, the most powerful nations that uh, seem to give a sense of direction that people must follow. I don't mind if you hold me accountable for what I'm doing, but again, you must be able to listen. There is no such a power that people have that they should not be able to listen, to listen to others. Listen to my explanation, listen to my concerns. That's what happens, so, and that's what should happen if we are to relate well and address some of these challenges the world faces today. There must be a sense of listening, listening to one another. And then that would allow us to take ownership of our affairs in a way that fits well with the rest of the world. So, friends of Rwanda or honorary Rwandans, uh, I had uh, Mwenda complain about. Uh, so, we are happy to be here. We are happy that you associate with our country, and many of you do a lot of things in our country, supporting our education, our health, in other fields, agriculture, different kinds of investments. And for Rwanda's uniqueness that was talked about, it's not just Rwanda that has this uniqueness or that it should have this uniqueness. Uh, it's what many other countries or many other Africans, or African nations, should and can easily have. And I think it is very clear that many African nations are showing desire to work towards this end. And as we learn from our own cultures and the cultures of others and be mindful of our challenges and uh, our business uh, to, to keep growing, to grow with the people. The moment we put our people at the center of every one of these activities, I think culture becomes very helpful in acting as a glue, as holding the societies together, our people together. And I think for us in Rwanda, it has been very challenging to rebuild the country for the last 22 years. But it has been a very happy experience as well 
to see that what we are doing is working. Is working for us, at least it works for us. It may not work for other people, also mainly in their opinions, because it really doesn't affect them. But we think it is working for us, we who live these lives that are affected one way or the other. Even when we are so hard beat and uh, we don't give up, we are never thrown off balance and we are held up, standing by this rich culture that is expressed in many ways, not only practically the way it happens, and even through the music, the different arts, the different expressions, as was uh, expressed by many others before. So finally, my message to the young Rwandans who are here, our children, the children of Rwanda, the young and upcoming, already some leaders, others uh, growing to be leaders, studying here, working here, doing many things, useful things uh, to you, yourselves. In fact, by extension, when the things you are doing are meaningful to you and useful to you, I want to believe that they are meaningful to your country, where you come from, to your families. And I want to invite you to consider these values, the Rwandan culture, our history, our dignity, as guiding principles so that when you are here, and I always tell even my own children, some of whom are here, and my other children generally in Rwanda, I consider all these Rwandans my children. But what I tell them is, go out there, go to United States. It's a good place, it's a great country. There is a lot to learn from there. But be mindful of not embracing those things that are not suitable to you or to your country. Just pick those things that are suitable. And there are many of them. But you need to be guided through that by knowing how to choose best on these cultures, values, that our society, that our nations, my country, upholds as their own that are also good. Everything may not be good, even for us, but that's the whole process. We change. That's how 
countries modernize, develop, they overcome these barriers brought about by some of these things that must change. But as you change your own and bring in and embrace others, uh, good things that may work for you, uh, there should be no mix-up that uh, causes problems instead of advancement and development that we want. So that is the message to the young people and others. Even the old ones, they can pick something from that. Uh, it's never too late. It's never too late. Uh, if you consider that uh, you fully understand what this entails and the change that must come, and that actually we can do many things, starting by ourselves. And then as we cooperate and work with others, as we embrace others, like they would embrace us, then more things are done because there is no nation that is an island in this sense. People work together, but you must start from somewhere. That core that place where you get started is uh, brought out clearly by who we are, by some of the points my friend Rick Warren mentioned, including being able to, to have an identity, to have something that will call yours something you should be proud of, uh, something that uh, will endure and stay with us and our children and their children uh, and for a long time. So once again, I thank you and the, the friends, the friends who are here People who are not in a Saturday Rwandans or others, I really most sincerely want to thank you for <laughs> these are friends, uh, even when uh, we have been under attack, they have not hesitated to defend uh, our positions. And there are many in this audience. And they defend us not just because they want to defend Rwanda, or because uh, they owe Rwanda anything. It also comes from uh, what they see, what they believe in, and from understanding of uh, how complex this world we live in is, the injustices, the prejudices, the, you know, the kind of situation who, that says uh, Rwanda, so what? What is Rwanda? Where is it? Where? Which part of the world is this thing, this small thing? You know, there are people who have no time. Who just, even uh, just on uh, a small provocation, if, if somebody came up, with the, you, know, you know, there's a small country there, it's not good, it's full of bad guys, you know. Let's go and invade it. You say, oh, what is it? OK, go ahead and do it. <laughs> you know, we, we have a world that operates like this, just like this. They don't even want to bother say, what? what? 
What happened? Who is doing what? Show me evidence. No, they have no time for that. There's no time for that. So imagine if you live in a world that operates like this, where people who have so much power decide just by a stroke of a pen without having to listen to what is going on. Imagine if you are not there for yourself, what really happens? Just imagine. You just keep living on borrowed time. We don't want to live on borrowed time. It is our time. <laughs> so you can choose to waste your time. Or you can choose to live on borrowed time. But I want us to choose believing that it is our time. And by the way, because it is. <laughs> so if uh, you live on a borrowed time, it seems uh, you, you are living a borrowed life. Think about that. So I want to join many who believe that it is our lives. We have to manage it, manage it as well as we can, relate to the rest of the world as well as we can, listen, not just behave like others who don't listen, and first listen to ourselves. <laughs> that is what will continue to take us through these difficulties as we continue to develop, to grow economies, to join the others who have left us. They are so far ahead, and uh, there is no reason why we can't catch up and be with them at the high table. Uh, because this world, you know, some people are sitting at the high table there, and others are here, and then others, are, and others are on the floor. <laughs> so I think we belong up there. Unless you convince me why we can't be up there. But it will come from every one of you. Everyone. In fact, my job which you entrusted me with is just you do the harder part, the hard work. My job is just to make sure that everybody does that. <laughs> that everyone is participating. That everyone is involved. And then uh, the rest of these uh, injustices, prejudices, as they have started uh, being, they will be history. And we shall be where we want to be. Thank you very much. Thank you.